Welcome to a special web meeting, episode two. And it is my great pleasure to participate in uh, this special webinar meeting as a chair. And I would like to first thank uh, Apeji and uh, Haifu for uh, giving me this opportunity. So now we are going to start. Maybe I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Chi uh, Chang Chang. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, Professor Chang, uh, Super uh, Intendant uh, uh, Chang Hospital Taiwan and President of Taiwan Association for Minimally Invasive Gynecology and Chief Supervisor Taiwan Association of Obstetrics and Gynecology and also President Elect of Asia Pacific Association of Gynecology and Endoscopy, uh, APG. And next slide, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Susumi. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm also, it's my honor to be here to introduce uh, Dr. Susumi, uh, especially this COVID-19 pandemic period. I'm very happy you are well now, and I hope you also keep your body good, uh, especially this, this period. Now, Dr. Professor Susumi Osami, uh, Osami actually is my best friend. We uh, have the uh, a lot of time uh, joined together for the uh, international meeting. He, he is a professor graduate at the School of the International University of Hair and Welfare, Director Sano uh, Hospital, Japan. He is also is a, a teacher and the past president of the Japan Society and and Obstetric Endoscopy and the Minimum uh, Therapy. Also past president of the Japan Society of Fertilization and uh, Implantation. We are also the past president and the past Congress president of the uh, APH, uh, pre uh, and uh, president of the uh, OBGYN PRP uh, Treatment Study Group. So, you know, we have, uh, I am very happy here to introduce uh, Professor Chuchumi, the wonderful professor. And uh, I hope after meeting the, the Professor Chuchumi, he will give us a wonderful comment. The next one, I will also introduce this, the other, the other wonderful doctor, and he is, she is the speaker, Professor Aruna Adran. Uh, Professor, Pro, Professor Aruna Adran, he is the uh, association, associate professor, uh, department of OBGYN University of Malaya. You know, also sec secretary, uh, gynecology endoscopy society of Malaysia, and also vice president Young Apache Group, and uh, while also vice president, and uh, he is also president and the chief of the University of the Malaya Medical Alumni Association, and uh, also the Apache committee member. And uh, Professor Dr. Edelman, I will be Linko Chang Memory Hospital. She is a wonderful doctor and is a very kindness. And I'm very happy and my honor here to introduce this, this wonderful doctor. Uh, doctor Adonan, Adonan will give us a very wonderful topic. He will talk about the diagnosis of a placenta aprita and the cesarean session, the scar pregnancy. Actually, we are OBGYN doctor. We all know this topic is a very very important because maybe it's the crisis of your early pregnancy, the woman and mother. So that's it. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Aruna Adler, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Chang. Uh, it's so nice to be called back again to present on something. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee and Professor Susumi for inviting me over for this talk. Now I have been given the uh, task of actually talking about the diagnosis of placenta accreta and cesarean pregnancy. And specifically, we are to be looking at the clinical protocols and its outcomes. So yes, uh, all right. So yes, that is me. Thank you again for this invitation. Now, let me just take you back again through to the definition so that we are clear in a very short uh, period of time. What was previously known as a morbidly adherent placenta 
okay, is what we now know as a placenta accreta spectrum. And that includes the increta, okay, where it is, uh, the placenta is attached to the myometrium, okay, and the accreta, which is what we usually know when it is, uh, you know, it is attached to the uh, to the uterus, okay, the placenta is attached to the uterus. Hang on, uh, let me see, am I blocking? Okay, it attaches deeply to the uterine wall, but if it undergoes increasingly, it enters into the uterine muscle, it becomes an increta. And when it goes completely throughout the myometrium, sometimes even penetrating into the bladder, we call it a percreta. So we understand that it is because of a defect of the endometrial myometrial interface. So there is a failure of normal decidualization uh, in the area of the uterine scar. Okay, so this will now allow deep placental anchoring, villis, and trophoblast infiltration. Okay, so what happens is that uh, usually the risk factors are perhaps a previous cesarean delivery and previous number of cesarean deliveries. Now, in general, across the board, all right, the generally accepted practice is for a caesarean hysterectomy to be done, either immediately or a delayed caesarean hysterectomy in the sense that the placenta is removed first or the placenta is left behind and immediately we take out the whole thing. So I hope that this uh, webinar will give us, share us some new ideas on what else we can do for these patients. Okay, so I have uh, collaborated and taken three consensus. One is from America, okay, and uh, from the American College of ONG. Uh, we can see that the um, recommendations are always about making sure that you diagnose it properly with an ultrasound and managing the placenta accreta patients early within the antenatal period having a standardized approach in a multidisciplinary care team, okay? And for a delivery to be early within 34 to 35 weeks or maybe 37 weeks at the most. And when there is hemorrhage, there must be support with a rapid transfusion protocol and expectant management, if any, should only be considered as long as the patient understands, uh, okay, the uncertain benefits and efficacy of the situation. All right, so these are the recommendations. The British uh, recommendations are a little bit more detailed, but nevertheless, it also covers similar things in the sense that the antenatal diagnosis is important, okay, and if they require a caesarean section, all right, we must alert the antenatal care team of this higher risk, okay? And they also identify that the diagnosis is an ultrasound. And um, I will show you later where they uh, incorporate the usage of MRI. All right. With the Australian and New Zealand uh, protocols, okay, it is stated, it's a very short protocol, but they say that placenta accreta is difficult to diagnose, but if it is diagnosed, then again, it is the optimization of maternal hemoglobin, iron stores, and medical facilities. Again, they emphasize here has to be available potentially for a hysterectomy and massive blood transfusion. So in essence, all three um, believe, believe in that. Okay, hang on. It has, okay, it has gone a bit too far. Okay. So, all right, <clears throat> okay, hang on, it went a bit too far, yeah, okay, we're here, okay, so all three actually come up to uh, the same conclusion, it is the diagnosis of using an ultrasound, we can incorporate MRI and a multidisciplinary team approach to support in the event there is a need for a hysterectomy and blood transfusion. Um, within the American guidelines, they specifically mention what is to be done pre-operatively, intra-operatively, post-operatively, and it all very much is detailed into a surgical preparation. 
situation. Okay, with the uh, British also, again, I think here it is um, a repetition, but they also now suggest that yes, you can use an MRI and the absence of risk, they still suggest a delivery between 35 to 36 weeks, but they uh, suggest also that larger studies are needed to look into the efficacy of radiology, okay, in the diagnosis of uh, placenta accreta spectrum, okay, and the role of interventional radiology needs to be discussed, it is not very clear. Uh, with the Australian guideline, again, they repeat about the usage of cell saver, um, that they must remain close to the hospital for worry that they may bleed and hemorrhage. So the timing of the cesarean section should be considered um, desirable to perform it as an elective rather than that of an emergency procedure. So I know it is a bit of a messy slide, but I have uh, taken, you know, I wanted you to see that in essence, um, they seem to agree on the general management of the placenta accreta. So for the Americans, the hysterectomy is the typical treatment. They highlight, of course, the complications are hemorrhage, injury to your pelvic organs, loss of future fertility. And there are techniques of removal of the placenta, repairing the resulting defect, or even removing the placenta and putting in a battery balloon. And some have also advocated placental cord ligation uh, you know, and then we leave it inside too. Uh, but of course, a patient has to be counseled regarding the risk of infection, sepsis, etc. Um, the British are a little bit more conservative. It is still a cesarean section hysterectomy. And looking at the data with the green top guidelines, also they say that a uterus preserving surgical technique should only be attempted by surgeons, uh, working in teams, expert surgeons, okay, who have the expertise to manage such cases. And they highlighted that there are not enough data to suggest that you should stand the ureters uh, in case uh, you know, you're worried about uh, involving the ureters. There is currently insufficient data, but it may be a role if you feel that the urinary bladder is going to be invaded or at least intraoperatively, you see that it is invaded by the placental tissue. So limited evidence to support uterus preserving surgery in placenta percrita, and they should be informed of a high risk of peripartum and secondary complications, including the need of a secondary hysterectomy if the uterus was preserved in the very beginning. Right? And again, uh, in the Australian guidelines, um, you know, the uh, idea is to deliver the placenta through an incision away from the placenta. This is the recommendation. Trim the cord close to the insertion site, repair the uterus, okay, you can do that. And it can be a conservative management, but nevertheless, the, uh, data has suggested that two thirds of them, you may avoid a hysterectomy, but one third of them would still require a hysterectomy because of this uncontrollable bleeding. So yes, I have put it up there again. Um, you can take your time to read on that. Um, with regards to hysteroscopic resection of placental remnants. Now, a large study shows that um, there were 12 women, okay, who underwent hysteroscopic resection. One required a hysterectomy subsequently, but there were nine successful cases, okay? And they picked up a study uh, with Haifu uh, in conjunction with the hysteroscopic study uh, resection, meaning to say that Haifu was uh, performed and subsequently followed by a hysteroscopic resection. Success in all 25 patients, but nine patients required more than one hysteroscopic resection. Two patients had uterine perforation. Uh, one actually had hemorrhagic shock and required emergency uterine repair. So their conclusion is that given the limited data, frequency of adverse events and proportion, uh, and patients needing a repeat procedure, routine hysteroscopic resection with or without high intensity focused ultrasonography at that point was not recommended. Okay, so I am interested to find out our subsequent speakers as to how uh, we can uh, sort out this issue. Okay, um, similarly, nothing different 
from uh, the American guidelines as well. Um, elective peripartum hysterectomy may be unacceptable to women desiring uterine preservation, but uh, you know, <laughs> if it is considered inappropriate, leaving the placenta inside to should be considered, but you need to remember that they can still go into a sudden uh, requirement of a yeah, um, uh, uh, if it is if the placenta is left in situ, two, then you need to monitor that to make sure that uh, they do not have any complications such as uh, bleeding or infection. Methotrexate adjuvant therapy we know has been started and been used, but it is um, their recommendation is that it's not to be used for expectant management, as it has unproven benefits and significant adverse effects. But then again, this was added new in 2018. There are papers, there are papers to suggest that it actually works. And I think we will show that later. Okay, so <clears throat> role of interventional radiology, we know that uh, they do that for uterine R3 embolization is also co-performed with a hysteroscopy for such cases, particularly in uh, cesarean scar pregnancies. And they also say that it can uh, perhaps be managed um, if you can control the hemorrhage, okay? And hopefully there is no hemorrhage uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, balloon catheters also suggest, uh, you know, you need further evaluation whether or not we can put a balloon catheter in uh, subsequently in the delivery of a placenta accreta. So the objective is, of course, to diminish blood loss to diminish blood loss and to hasten placenta reabsorption. Okay, that is the idea of this conservative or expectant management. But uh, uterine devascularization, that means you, you stop the blood supply. The principle is to put in a balloon, you know, balloon placement within the uterine artery, or you might want to embolize the uterine artery, or even for that matter, ligate. So uh, the whole idea is actually to stop this blood loss. Now, Post-delivery methotrexate is also another technique that people do. This is supposed to help with the placental involution, shrinking, and resorption by the system. And there are also people who suggest, and they do a delayed interval hysterectomy, which is later. So that is also up for discussion uh, within this uh, webinar session, I reckon. So in summary, placental accreta spectrum is increasingly common, and I have done a lot of reading particularly within the uh, Chinese nation where now they have a two child uh, prince uh, what do you call it a two child uh, two child uh, concept that uh, cesarean sections are more common so on the range of about 1 to 2000 uh, cases you may have a cesarean scar pregnancy for example which we are going to cover after this but we also know that it is a significant morbidity and mortality and so at this point in time, with a PAS, a placental accreta spectrum, we know that we need to know the risk factors. We need to know the antenatal imaging. Okay. We understand that a cesarean hysterectomy could be the penultimate or the uh, final uh, procedure that needs to be done. Okay. Uh, then it is the most accepted approach by many at this point in time. So if we are talking about a conservative management or expectant management, it is only for carefully selected cases, okay? After detailed counseling, and at this point in time, the recommendation is that it is only considered as investigational. All right, so now let's get into the cesarean scar pregnancy. It is rare, very rare, but nevertheless, it does happen. And out of 500 plus uh, cesarean scars, there could be one which ends up with a uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. Some say that it is almost like an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, now usually diagnosed within the first trimester. And if you do not treat it, it subsequently can become part of a placental accreta spectrum. Okay, so the gestational sac okay, is embedded in the uterine window at the site of the actual cesarean scar where you actually perform the caesar. So if you allow this pregnancy to happen, all right, the risk of placenta accreta spectrum is just 100%. All right, so there are criterias to it. Okay, so one is that when you put it on ultrasonography, I will show you the pictures. Okay, so 
on the ultrasonography, you will see the criteria will be an empty uterus with a good endometrial lining that you can see. Perhaps a gestational sac at the end near to the isthmus, okay? And you will see if you put on the Doppler, peritrophoblastic invasion and the Doppler that is actually vascularization within the area of this isthmus. And if it is a, a bit more advanced, you can also see thinning of the myometrium and the um, plane between the myometrium and the bladder can actually be compromised. Okay, so the Chinese Medical Society have actually uh, typed the, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, categorized the uh, cesarean sections, uh, pregnancy, um, cesarean scar pregnancy into three. Uh, one, which is closer, okay, closer, mostly located within the uterine cavity, but some of it, okay, it's, it's closer. And then uh, type two, uh, partially implanted, but um, majority of it is still within the myometrium. And type three, where it is almost extruding outwards, okay, extruding outwards, uh, and uh, it almost appears uh, like it is towards the bladder. Okay, so you can see, you can see the myometrium is really significantly thinner. So that's a type one, two, and three. So very much the current novel approaches depend on the grade of the, um, the grade of the um, CSP, grade of the CSP, all right. So again, I'm going to recap. The diagnosis is an empty uterine cavity, okay? Clearly visible endometrium. You see the gestational sac at the anterior isthmus or the caesarean scar. There is a lack or diminished myometrium between the bladder wall and the mass, okay? Or it could be like a complete discontinuity. You, you can't see the anterior muscular tissue. And when you do a Doppler, you can see high blood flow, high velocity, but a low impedance of the peritrophoblastic flow surrounding the gestational sac, okay? And one test that you can do is that when you apply gentle pressure to the cervix, the gestational sac does not slide. So that means it is, you know, part of it. It's part of it. All right, so here are some pictures to suggest. Here, empty uterus with the endometrial lining. You can see here the sac, endometrial lining, and the bladder pretty near. All right, velocity, high velocity, low impedance, peritrophoblastic invasion, blood supply over here. Right, and um, so I sometimes feel like it is easier to relate if there is a case. So I picked up a case that happened to us uh, this year within the University of Malaya Medical Center, where she was a 43-year-old gravida 4 para 2 plus 1, who actually underwent assisted reproductive therapy because of an unexplained secondary infertility. And what happened was that she presented at 21 weeks in this pregnancy with a persistent vaginal bleeding for a month. So when we scanned her, and that was at 16 weeks, you know, an early scan, it was a, you know, a small uh, fetus with a low-lying placenta. So of course, the idea was to admit her for a threatened miscarriage. She was treated with eutrogestin, dufaston, NTD, and the sort. But she had multiple episodes of per vaginal bleeding. So at that point, at 25 weeks, we thought, okay, this could be antipartum hemorrhage due to a low-lying placenta. She was administered steroids. But as weeks went by, the serial scans, we were even more suspicious of this placenta accreta spectrum. So could this actually be a cesarean scar pregnancy? And then what happened was that she was kept in the ward for the longest time until she was about 35 weeks, okay? And she had one episode of vaginal fluid. So we knew at that point it was a PPROM. It was a pre-labor, premature rupture of membranes. And she underwent a cesarean section. And what we found was that there was placental invasion at the uterine serosa. So she bled. She bled for about two liters. We had to transfuse her with one pint of pack cells. And when the cesarean hysterectomy was completed, we sent it for a histopathological um, examination 
it came back as placenta increta with adenomyoma. So can we see here that there is a loss of plane between the bladder okay, and the uterus? This was what we had. We had a CT scan, an MRI, a CT scan, CT scan of this patient. It's a loss of plane. Okay. And this was the resultant hysterectomy. So the baby was delivered, but nevertheless, we chose not to save the uterus because uh, for fear of bleeding. And you can see the really thin uh, border there. Okay. And that was the placenta. All right. That was the placenta. So when we go through protocols and how, um, you know, uh, around the world, what do people do? Um, I picked up this study, which, you know, looks at what happens when you have a cesarean, uh, cesarean scar pregnancy with a positive fetal heartbeat or with a negative fetal heartbeat. But um, what came about was that, um, well, almost 40% had severe bleeding. And if they did progress to the third trimester, some ended up with a uterine rupture, um, hysterectomy, unfortunately, well, there was no maternal death here. But with the negative fetal heart, even if they wanted to perform a conservative management, and usually this was within the first to the second trimester, they do undergo, um, okay, yes, many actually just have like an uncomplicated miscarriage, um, but there are about 30% or so which ended up with a complicated miscarriage. Thank God there was no hysterectomy needed or maternal death. So a Turkish study came out with this protocol where if you do have a cesarean scar pregnancy and the algorithm is as such that if there is a fetal heart and you know if your patient requires for a termination of pregnancy, then you've got to think about the most appropriate treatment. Okay. If they want to continue the pregnancy, then we have to de decide whether this is high risk for uh, increta, percrita, and risk of cesarean uh, hysterectomy, or if it is at the scar itself, uh, what do we do? Is it low risk? If there is no fetal heart, the uh, protocol suggests that um, you, you follow through, follow through until the beta HCG becomes zero. All right. So, in summary, if you have a positive fetal heart with a cesarean scar pregnancy, you are worried about now severe hemorrhage, early uterine rupture, hysterectomy, and uh, severe uh, bleeding. Okay, um, if okay, there is a significant proportion that may go to term, like the patient that we had. Um, you know, it is questionable whether termination should be the only therapeutic option that is offered. Uh, maybe they, they don't, they don't have to be terminated, all right? But with the negative fetal heart, expectant management can be a reasonable option, all right, in view of low likelihood of uh, maternal complications as we showed just now, but patients still need to have a close surveillance, okay, to make sure that there is no uh, severe outcome. So with regards to treatment modality, um, we look through the literature and what we can find is expectant management, systemic or local methotrexate, you know, systemic is through the intravenous or uh, systemic, sorry, not intravenous, it's systemic as usual. Uh, and the local is actually guided, after some guided into the uh, area of the suspected uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. Some do needle aspiration with MTX. Okay, uterine curettage seems to be quite commonly done. Uh, hysteroscopy, some even try to do, and this is a novel idea of a transvaginal curettage. So between the border of the cervix and the anterior fornix, a, tr uh, a transverse, uh, uh, transverse resection is made where it is then uh, you know, um, uh, removed, uh, but it's novel. Then you have the uterine artery embolization followed by the curettage and hysteroscopy, um, I would be most comfortable with the laparoscopic cesarean scar resection, push the bladder down and then locate the area, perhaps with vasopressin 
and cut the area and suture it back. That would be good for the type three of the cesarean scar pregnancy. And um, <clears throat> many have also reported cases of repeated high full ablation, okay, high intensity frequency ultrasound, and also making a pairing of high full plus hysteroscopic uh, suction and curettage. So let's wait and see what the other speakers have said. So we looked at it. Um, systemic review shows that there are so many ways, okay, there are more than one way to skin a cat, so many ways. And even in this group where the first protocol was a wedge resection, okay, just to remove the, the area, uh, protocol two was a suction curetouch, okay, so protocol one is a laparoscopically done, suction curetouch, uh, trans uh, hysteroscopically. Systemic methotrexate, protocol four is systemic plus local methotrexate, but inevitably it did not show major differences. Um, nothing much different aside from hemoglobin levels, because perhaps the surgical ones, they probably there's a drop of hemoglobin. But in terms of uh, days of discharge, in terms of waiting for the beta ECG levels to come down, um, the beta ECG levels come down slower within those with the methotrexate uh, format. Okay, so um, summary says that there are not really much significant differences. So the best would actually to select the most appropriate protocol after discussing with your patient. Okay. All right, so here are my references, and this is the lady whom uh, had that placenta accreta in Krita, and she has uh, survived, uh, thank God, and she is now a spokesperson for a blood uh, donation, um, and that is the, uh, you know, the, 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 the joyful baby uh, that came out of it and who stayed with us for the duration that she will had to stay within the hospital. So um, I hope I have managed to define and uh, tell us, uh, you know, remind each other where we actually stand. And perhaps at the end of this uh, webinar, we can close the gap by getting new and a little bit more predetermined ideas on what we shall do with cesarean pregnancies, um, cesarean scar pregnancies. Thank you very, very much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Aruna. Uh, it's wonderful, very wonderful, very wonderful topic. Is, is there any question? <coughs> mm. Aruna, actually, I have one question. Yes. Uh, you ever talk about talk talk about the uh, uh, the Mm, about the uterine artery uh, embolization, right? Yes. Uh, if the patient uh, have one more baby, mm. do you do you no do you use the TA? No. Yes, no. you are very right. Thank you, uh, Prof. Chi, for explain uh, for highlighting that. Uterine mm -hmm. artery embolization, we have to counsel the patient that we do not know its effects on the uterine, uh, on the endometrial uh, function and quality subsequently. So if they are mm -hmm. in need for another uh, uh, a child, uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we have our reservations to, to promote that idea. Okay, good. Because so of the I have that, embolization. Yeah, great. Okay. I have the other question. Yes, do you use the DOPRA? Uh, to check the accreta or increta or cesarean section scar precans the the blood flow do you use yes we do yeah okay Doppler, any Doppler sound mm -hmm. any comment about the Doppler flow because actually is not maybe is not um, give you a definite diagnosis because maybe there is the neovascularization. Do you Correct. have any experience about that? Well, um, we don't get many cesarean scar pregnancies. Uh, so the one, two that comes to us, most of it is basically a 
ultrasound, uh, as I said, the criteria to see the location. Uh, the Doppler is like an adjuvant or an additional help, if any. Um, but you, you might be right. Yes, you are right. Because uh, sometimes the vascularization can be also impaired. Um, we have not yet used the MRI, but uh, it is being suggested that MRI is, is, is uh, uh, recommended. Uh, what is your opinion? Do you do you use? Do you depend on that? Um, actually, I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, my experience here is, if you use the Doppler flow to check the flow, yep. but actually just give you um, some message only. Sometimes it's very severe, but you uh, get inside. Maybe you open the flow to me, but it is the very soft adhesion only. So I can remove the greater the placenta very easily. At that time, I always say that, thanks God. Thanks God help this mother. Yeah. yeah. Is there any question? Uh, Professor Chushumi, do you have any experience and any comment to us? Yeah. Uh, I, I, oh, thank you. Uh, for your very beautiful presentation and uh, i am uh, interested in uh, expectant or conservative management of uh, placenta crater and you have shown uh, mtx and uh, hyph do, do do you you yourself have experience or some do you know some paper uh, uh, describing this procedure? Yeah, there are quite a few papers describing the usage of MTX uh, mm -hmm. with curatage, but I have not seen MTX with Haifu. Mm -hmm. yes. Not yet. Yeah, no, I've, I've not seen that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was looking through there because there are not many cases. I mean, I touch wood, I thank God, I don't get many cases of such in my practice. So I was looking at all the papers and uh, and, and there is a lot of usage of MTX followed by Curitage. But interestingly, as you said, Professor Sumi, there is no MTX plus Haifu. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that it may work? Is it necessary? Because I would have thought Haifu would, you know, act on it immediately already you yeah. go MTX. Yeah. So, MTX maybe get it smaller and uh, uh, high maybe acting uh, smaller. Sm more smaller. Smaller. And finally, maybe uh, hysteroscopic we'll be maybe Co uh, combi in combination of yeah. many treatment. The literature also suggests that the gestational site is only approximately maximally about nine millimeters so it's ah, you know it's not maybe so big in the okay. first place mm -hmm. so, yeah mm -hmm. so so that's that sorry we are talking about a cesare scar pregnancy right yes yes okay yes. so <laughs> professor Tsutsumi, do, yes. do you have any mts for scar pregnancy experience do you uh my, my I, I have no experience of host, okay. uh, usage of scar. Okay. Uh, but uh, we sometimes use MTX for placenta rest or ectopic yeah, pregnancy. Yeah. And uh, recently, we are going to try uh, GnRH antagonist or okay. agonist to yeah. reduce uh, hormone level. Mm -hmm. We are now trying it. So we, I, how, how about the uh, Athena? Do if you have the pregnancy the in Krita, placenta in Krita or, or Krita, after surgery, the mm -hmm. patient is good, very good, and uh, and the recovery wonderful. After that, do you use the MTS injection for her? No. No. Not in our practice. Not so, in our practice. Okay. So if he, the patient want the other the children or the other baby, do you recommend or you do something for her? 
that is very controversial. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> that is very controversial because I think then um, we 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 have not much experience. We don't use MPX for placental resorption. We say that we try to preserve the uterus, but inevitably it is still life over pregnancy. So I think most of our patients also they understand in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Actually, the MTS, the other problem uh, is uh, how many doses do you use? Local ejection or general ejection, IM ejection, or how many doses you use? That is, is a problem. Is there any question? It's a wonderful topic. Is there anyone comment or any question? Okay. If you have no any question, we hello. Hi, Hi yeah. everybody. Yeah, okay. You Can are you Zina, right? Me? Zina? You are Zina, right? Do you hello? Have can you listen to me? Yes, I can. Ah, thank you? you very much for yeah. Uh, you thank you very much for the wonderful, wonderful lecture. And just I am uh, wondering that is there any any prevention, preventive role during C-section to prevent the scar pregnancy, my first question. And the second question is that the most of the literature says that the role of uh, MTS, that is methotrexate, is really insignificant. So um, how far it is true? That's two question to Dr. Uh, Zira, which is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zina. Um, I, I agree. Uh, literature also says that the role of MTX is uh, questionable because uh, in most of their treatment protocols, they actually incorporate the uh, suction and curettage or a hysteroscopic evacuation. That's one. So yes, I, 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 I question that as well. Uh, with regards to uh, caesarean uh, scar incision and repair, um, I came across something quite interesting. It says that nowadays people are uh, suturing only one layer. Is is that common? One layer. One layer. So I don't know. I mean, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's many, many obstetricians they like that, but I don't do personality. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the the literature review says that if you have five hundred uh, caesarean sections uh, scars, uh, you know. Uh, maybe one will end up, but I, I, I think that number is, no, it's not one in 500, it's like one in 2,000 or so. So that's quite rare. Uh, one will end up in cesarean scar pregnancy. But I think the fact that it is such a rare uh, occurrence as well, it's a bit difficult. <clears throat> it's a bit difficult to find studies and recommendations. Do you have any suggestions yourself, Dr. Zinat? Maybe you have suggestions on how to improve uh, uh, Caesareans. Well, actually, uh, I didn't. I didn't find anything in the literature. That's why I'm, why I was wondering that probably you will I know better than me. Yeah. I came across it's one in two thousand Caesars, and apparently uh, it is rising now because more and more people are opting for cesarean section. Yeah. Okay, it's true. Hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. I was okay. yesterday in RCG Congress in the London. And they also discussed a, a huge say, one hour session on pass. So Khalid uh, from Saudi Arabia, he uh, delivered an excellent lecture. What he suggested that, uh, yeah, you, you can draw a line on the scar or on the PS. If it is above the scar, probably it is, it is it, you can allow the patient to continue pregnancy it is not that not that dangerous but if the scar of pregnancy below the line that line is dividing oh. the uterus into two parts so that is a wonderful message what we learned yesterday from the RCG congress in london thank you thank you okay uh, i afraid we will must go to the, the other session so i must close this session so Professor Chuchumi, it's your turn. It's yours. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Lee Ja Song. Uh, his title is the Clinical Experience of Ultrasound Guided High Treatment for Gynecologic Disorders at the Single Center in South Korea. Next slide, please. 
Yeah. He, the first high doctor in obstetric and gynecology of South Korea and uh, participated in Congress as a lecturer. For example, the first young international summit of minimally invasive and non-invasive medicine. And uh, he had uh, published ultrasound guided high intensity focus ultrasound uh, treatment for uterine fibroid and adenomyosis, a single center experience for the Republic of Korea. And he had so many papers and uh, he is one of the uh, leader of uh, Korean gynecologist and he has very uh, experience in high treatment. So uh, we are going to invite him to give us a lecture. Professor, Dr. Sompri. Uh, uh, thank you. Good evening, sir. Hello, nice to meet you. I am Jae Sung Lee from South Korea. I am the first Chungjing Hype Doctor of Korea and the first gynecologist Hype Doctor in Korea. I have treated uterine fibroid and adenomyosis by Hype during 13 years from 2010. And now I have treated about 2,900 Hype case. I have used JC and JC effective model for Hype treatment. I hope my experience of hypo may help you take care of your patient in your hospital or in your clinics. I will present 13 years my hypo experience. As you know, three effects against tumor cell by treatment with hypo appears. Uh, the first, direct thermal ablation. The second, cavitation effect, destroying tumor cell by increasing cytoplasm temperature. The third, damage to tumor nursing blood capillary, coagulation necrosis. This is the record I request of the Ministry of Health and Welfare in June 2012 for hyper permission for uterine disease. This is insured in Korea in February 2013. After that, many doctors and hospitals have started hyper treatment This paper for my hype story. Until this year, I have reported some papers of hype treatment. Demographic data of uterine fibroid and adenomyosis. Average age was 41, and average treatment time is 80 minutes. This paper. Uh, Journal of Ultrasound and Sonochemistry in 2015. The second paper uh, was Journal of Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology in 2019. This table is a follow-up result of the post hyper treatment in uterine fibroid. The total of 918 fibroid was treated. Uterine fibroid volume reduction rate were 55, 63, 74%, and 3, 6, and 12 months respectively. Decreasing symptom severity score scale and increasing the uterine fiber symptom and quality of light was statistically significant. The figure was shown. Total of 889 adenomyces was treated. The uterine volume reduction rate were 45, 51, and 60 percent at 3, 6, and 12 months respectively. Decreasing symptom severity score scale and increasing the uterine fiber symptom and the quality of light was statistically significant. The volume reduction rate was somewhat lower than uterine fibroid. I think that the reason why adenomyosis reduction rate is lower than myoma is the measurement of total uterine volume. In cases of adenomyosis, because I did measure the total uterine volume, the patient with adenomyosis have more severe symptoms, such as menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea. They are more satisfied with the dramatic result after hyper treatment. 
Here I prepared some example case of a hyper. Seven centimeter case of submucosa uterine fibroid was shown. non perfusion area was seen inside the boundaries of the tumor. After treatment in enhanced T1 weighted MRI image. After seven months later, necrotic lesion of myoma was disappeared in the uterus. No more myoma was observed in this MRI image. In cases of hypo of uterine fibroid, complete ablation close to the capsule of myoma would be reduced the relapse rate. This case is a five centimeter case of multiple uterine fibroid. Nine months later, the volume of myoma was reduced by 88% and there was no regrowing on the margin or no relapse. 34 months later, after treatment, necrotic lesion of myoma was exposed out of uterus. No more myoma was observed in this figure. This is another submucosal myoma hyper treatment case. Necrotic lesion by hype disappeared in three years follow-up MRI imaging. Submucosal type of myoma is one of the best cases for hyper treatment. This case is a cervical myoma. The cervical myoma was growing at high vascularity site of uterus and its nature is very soft. So hype treatment of a cervical myoma is a somewhat difficult and the recurrence rate is uh, more higher. First time, this patient received hypo at another clinic. The uterine fibroid was located uterine cervix. Previous hypo treatment was incomplete. I used GnRH agonist for three months before hypo, and then vision about 90% was treated. After six months later, region was decreased to 2.5 centimeter size region about 90-70% uh, decrease. Some cases of rapid decreasing size uh, was related to infection of region. If infection occur in hype region, region was more friable and easily detached like pus and discharge. If you suspect infection, antibiotic treatment was needed until symptom disappeared. Hypo can be non-surgical myomectomy and non-surgical adenomyomectomy, I think. This case was multiple fibroid, the size of uterine fibroid varied widely, and there were more than 20 in the uterus. For the best treatment with multiple uterine fibroid, important point is the making type 1 myoma by pre-medication like GnRH agonist. Type 1 fibroid were easily treated by diffusion energy or cavitation effect. If you meet patient like these cases, I recommend that you use GnRH agonist about two or three months before hypo. And then if cooling time is over two or three seconds, and the total treatment time get enough. Sufficient cavitation effect can be given to all myomas. This case is eight centimeter adenomyosis cases. She had two babies. I treated the entire lesion except the safe uterine margin near the bowel. 42 months later, uterine volume was decreased to 82%. She feels very good well. Severe menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea was disappeared. 12-centimeter diffuse huge adenoma ca adenomyosis cases. She received three times of in vitro fertilization for pregnancy. Superovulation injection made adenomyosis worse. I treated near entire region. Uterine volume was reduced by 87%. Hyper treatment for adenomyosis is the best non-invasive treatment of choice, except hysterectomy. 
this combined case is a submucosal myoma and diffuse adenomyosis case. She had diabetes mellitus and her hemoglobin level is a seven. Past he have two times myomectomy history. Level no gesterial IUD was inserted in uterine cavity, Mirena. Submucosal myoma and diffuse adenomyosis was shown. Usually, most gynecologists treat by hysterectomy like these cases. I think that hyper treatment can be a good treatment modality for this case. After nine months later, myoma was disappeared, uterine size was normalized. Menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea symptoms were totally disappeared. Hyper treatment could be non surgical myomectomy and non surgical adenomyomectomy. I'm really emphasized. She had a huge multiple uterine fibroid of a 7 cm, 6 cm, 5 cm size multiple. Because of a multiple myoma, uterus was enlarged to 14 cm length. I treated over 90 to 95% uh, of uterine fibroid. T1 weighted MRI image uh, shows well treated state. 15 months later, she was embarrassed because hysterectomy was recommended by a large hospital of a medical university. So she came to me, I recommend her enhanced MRI. 14 centimeter size uterus decreased seven and all treated myoma was non-enhanced stated and no new lesion. It was a very good post hyper treatment follow-up state. Usually, most gynecologists use diagnostic sonography, but they didn't figure out post hyper treatment state. Therefore, even if the treatment is well treated, hysterectomy is recommended only by looking at the shape of the uterine ultrasound image. All obstetrics and gynecologists should know that the treatment state of a patient who received the hype treatment can only be judged by examining the enhanced MRI image. This slide is a complication analysis for uh, 1,807 patients. 918 case of uterine fibroid, symptom recall of 42, new lesion of 23, secondary hypertreatment of 9, hysterectomy of 13, myomectomy of 8. 889 case of adenomyosis, symptom recall of 39, new lesion of 17, secondary hypertreatment of 17, hysterectomy of 20. Complication analysis. Uh, transient foot drop of one uh, and tumor rise syndrome and the pre-renal failure of one, small bowel perforation of two. In case of a transient foot drop and the small bowel perforation, I believe that mistake, for example, power control or interpretation of ultrasound image were made. The rest the complication, uh, sec first degree burn and second degree burn and transient hematria, uh, was uh, transient and minimal severe. This paper are uh, published in 2018. Journal is a clinical and experimental obstetric and gynecology. This paper is on intended pregnancy with term delivery following ultrasound guide hypo ablation of uterine fibroid and adenomyosis. 2070. Uh, British Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology. I checked anti mullerian hormone biomarker for ovarian reserve before and after hyper treatment. There was no significant difference in anti mullerian hormone level between the two, point, two time point. So we conclude that hyper treatment do not affect ovarian function. This slide is a hyper treatment for placenta accreta. I experienced two cases of retained placenta accreta. She had vaginal bleeding for six months after cesarean section. 
ultrasound image show two or three centimeter mass like uh, myoma. With hyper treatment, retained placenta region was disappeared after three months. Previously, I reported hyper treatment cases report with retained placenta. In 2016, uh, this is a journal of obstetric and gynecologic science. This is another treatment cases of retained placenta with hypo. Incomplete abortion bleeding occur after in vitro fertilization. Dilatation and creatage was performed two times, but there was continuous severe bleeding. Placenta invade the anterior myometrium of uterus. Complete ablation was done for region by hypo. After one month later, Beta HCG level was normalized at one month. This is abdominal wall endometriosis treatment cases by HYPO. I experienced two cases of abdominal wall endometriosis treatment by HYPO. This is the first case. She had a tender nodule uh, by menstrual cycle after laparoscopy. After hyper treatment, the symptom was subsided. This is a journal of gynecological endocrinology. Abdominal wall endometriosis treatment by hyper ablation. The last topic is the effect of a parasympathetic block uh, before ultrasound guide hyper treatment in uterine fibroid and adenomyosis. This study shows that parasympathetic block before ultrasound guide hyper treatment uh, was a cost effective method because it helped reduce the total treatment time, ablation time, and the total energy. Also, can be helpful for reducing, reducing the excessive use of intravenous sedation. This paper will be published within this year. Hyper treatment with very good therapeutic effect and acceptable side effect for uterine fibroid and adenomyosis and other solid gynecologic disease is the best non-invasive treatment so far. But we careful for patients who want a future pregnancy and inform some possibility of being in trouble of a pregnancy. Enough experience are needed to make a satisfactory treatment outcome. We have to approach carefully because treatment cases are all different density and different uh, location on each other and the treatment time and the power level are all different. I really appreciate your attention. I hope my experience might help you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for your beautiful and uh, kind of presentation based on your experience more than 2000 uh, cases. And uh, I admire you uh, publishing uh, papers, uh, your experiences and uh, congratulate on your success on yeah, publication. Thank you. And now uh, it is open to the discussion. And uh, if anyone, uh, uh, I have. Oh. Uh, I have. So, uh, first, uh, Doctor Chan. Doctor Chan. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have a three question. Mm -hmm. I am also have the high food case. The first one is so how do you? Um, but how about the, the the energy setting in different case? The first one. The mm -hmm. energy setting. The first. Mm -hmm. The second question is the actually you have the first degree burn about a 17 case and the second degree burn about 18 case in the patient. How do you deal with this burn case? The third one, um, you ever mentioned about abortion after two times abortion uh, operation, but a patient also have a lot of uh, vaginal bleeding. You use the high food to 
to three billion. And uh, no more breeding. But I have one, one question is, this case, after high food treatment, have a baby or not? It's my three question. Yeah. The first I use the hyper treatment power level is yeah. uh, energy setting. Energy oh, setting oh. is, is a JC 200D I used. Uh, I usually at least 350 over and okay. uh, usually 1400 power drill. Okay. Okay. How many, how many time? How long you you spend for each patient, each especially patient? the big myoma? Uh, in oh. many cases, I I treated at forty minute and ninety minute. Okay, it's, a, it's different case and multiple case and single case, solid case uh, is very different and. Mm -hmm. More huge sizes uh, uh, need to more time. More time, right? More time, okay. Yeah, okay. The second one about your burn case. How do you deal with it after the high blood treat treatment? The burn, uh, the skin burn. Ah, uh, skin burn. Yeah. Uh, many cases is the first degree burn is uh, only uh, dressing or two or three two or three days and, and after then and dry the skin. Mm -hmm. uh, if we use, uh, uh, we do not another medication uh, and uh, I have no third degree bone and mm -hmm. first and second degree bone case uh, easily treat uh, and only dressing. Okay. Only dressing? Only okay. dressing. And for uh, pro, uh, prophylactic antibiotics, uh, mm -hmm. five days. Okay, five days. How about the abortion case? The abortion case that you- Abortion case? Yes. You have ever mentioned about abortion. After abortion, you have the uh, vaginal breathing, but you use the high food to treat uh -huh. it. I say the case. I am out of the life, the case have a, before, uh, have a baby after high food? Uh, uh, a greater case or uh, post high pregnancy and the uh, And In that case, you ever mentioned about the abortion case? After abortion, the patient or uh, still vaginal breathing. So you use the high food to treat it. The patient have no more breathing. But my question is, this case have baby or not after high food? I think that the uh, before treatment to lesion of uh, myoma or adenomyosis affect the post hyper treatment and pregnancy. Uh, we can only oblige on the myoma or adenomyosis region, but uh, before treatment, uh, the region is was very severe. Uh, after hyper, the pregnancy is not good. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, if the region is not severe, or only a single, or, uh, or uh, some multiple, but not some multiple is not severe, we treated the hypo after she came pregnant. I think that hypo after hypo treatment pregnancy is better than uh, laparotomy, myomectomy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, and thank you for your this uh, excellent experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, the, uh, Dr. Lee. Yeah, yeah, your talk is interesting and instructive and uh, provoking. And I want to ask um, may, many questions, but uh, uh, time is limited. Um, maybe I ask you two. One is uh, pregnancy. Uh, uh, high 
after five treatment, uh, patient uh, in case of uh, pregnant, uh, maybe in surgery, after surgery, uh, cesarean delivery, but uh, in half case, how about the cesarean rate? Uh, type of delivery, vaginal delivery or cesarean? Oh, yeah. uh, after hyper treatment, I uh, I offer to cesarean section to patient, but he want to normal delivery. Mm -hmm. Be careful uh, if the the risk of uh, the trend rupture. Uh, you sh you should uh, receive the cesarean section. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you recommend cesarean, but cesarean in yeah. some case, uh, vaginal delivery. Oh, yes. okay, I, I understand. And uh, you sometimes you generate agonist, generate agonist treatment. Agonist. In some case, you presented GNR, GNRH hormone. Ah, uh, GNRH hormone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you select? Patient, huge one or oh, okay, okay. some case. Yeah. In cases of uh, uh, myoma and adenomyosis over than ten or twelve size centimeter size, I recommend two or three months. I use the GnRH agonist, mm -hmm. but uh, less than eight centimeter of myoma, mm -hmm. I uh, recommend only one use of a GnRH agonist. And uh, we can choose the treatment time. Mm -hmm. be, uh, is good to, is good uh, post-menstrual state. Mm -hmm. Pre-menstrual state is, uh, uh, she has uh, is more edematous and uh, uterine fiber is more, more edematous, is not good to hyper. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, you. Maybe it's time to move uh, next talk. So thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Dr. Chang asked you from the case who raised your... Uh, the placenta case uh, I experienced uh, the both case, I didn't admission a chemotherapy to her, but uh, if the HCG level mm -hmm. reduction is insufficient, uh, rather than five level, five after a DC, a DC placenta, uh, we should consider chemotherapy such as uh, methotrexate in addition. Okay. Oh, oh, thank, uh, thank you for uh, uh, answering another question. Thank you very much. So maybe next. Okay. Thank you, Professor Chuchumi. Now I will go to the other session about uh, high food. Uh, we have the wonderful speaker, Zhang Cai. Zhang Cai Jiao Shou, you want to use English or Chinese? Yes, I will talk in English. Ah, okay, good. Um, uh, we have a wonderful speaker, uh, Dr. Zhang Cai. Actually, the Dr. Zhang Cai is a senior high food doctor and also a very wonderful, well-experienced tutor and have a lot of the senior, uh, have a lot of the experience. Also is a membership of the International Society of the Minima Invasive and the Virtual Surgery and also the review of the International Journal of the Hyperthermia. The, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Zhang ever provide clinical training of the high food treatment at home and abroad, and ever be South Africa and Jordan and South Korea, and uh, to help to establish the high food center. So he also ever training more than 15 domestic doctors and more than 20 international medical staff, and have the complete about a whole Southern high food treatment case. So it's well, well experienced, well experienced doctor and the tutor. So let's welcome Dr. Zhang. 
Mm -hmm. So you would have given us the topic is the high food followed by DNC to treat the cesarean scar pregnancy and the clinical protocol and the outcome. Please, Dr. Zhang. Okay. So can you see my screen? Mm, yes, now. Okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chang. Uh, I'm Zhang Cai from National Engineering Research Center of uh, Ultrasound Medicine. Today, I will talk about high food followed by dilation and carotid to treat cesarean scar pregnancy and the clinical protocol and outcomes. Um, my talk will include uh, five parts. So first is the background about the cesarean scar pregnancy. It is defined uh, as the gestational sac implants at the scar side of the previous uh, cesarean section on the lower anterior um, uterine wall. We can see that here is a wedge shape and this area suggesting a uh, possible impaired healing. And uh, it is reported that the prevalence of um, cesarean defect uh, uh, in women with cesarean section is up to uh, 84%. And uh, this uh, kind of disease is first de described in 1978. And uh, the incidence is um, rare, but is between 1 uh, 1800 to 1 And it accounts for 6.1% uh, 6 of ectopic. Um, pregnancy with a history of at least one cesarean delivery. And in uh, recent years, the risk and the incidence of the CSP has been increased. We can see from a report from 2010 from the World Health Organization Global Survey, it showed that in Asia, the cesarean section rate is about uh, 27%. And in China is extremely high, as high as 46%. And uh, here is another report by uh, our Chinese people in 2014, that is four years later. This rate is increased to 55% for the cesarean section. So because the cesarean section rate is increased, so the uh, risk of the cesarean scar pregnancy is also risk. And in the past two decades, uh, I searched the literature. We found that the publication about CSP from, um, from the, uh, in the past two decades is more than 1,100 papers. And uh, we can see it here is uh, uptrend. And also we can see that the most, um, the highest number of publication is in China, followed by the North American and the England. And uh, the types of CSP, it has been introduced uh, for the um, first uh, lecturer that is Professor Adelan. And uh, I find uh, here is an international uh, classification. It is divided by two types. The first type is the endogenous type that we can see the gestational sac is totally inside the uterine cavity. And the type two is the exogenic type. So we can see that the gestational sac is grown outside and to the bladder and to the abdominal cavity. So this is the, an international classification. And also, as Professor Adelan said that uh, in China, our Chinese domestic uh, classification also uh, has a little bit different from the international one. So here are three types. The, uh, the type one and the type two are the endogenic type, but the difference is that, so for the type one, that's the most gestational sac located in the uterine cavity and only partially implanted in the scar. And the thickness of the uterine mild matron um, between the bladder and the gestational sac is more than three millimeters. But the type two is that the most gestational sac implanted in the scar 
and the thickness of the uterine myometrium between the bladder and the gestational sac is no more than three millimeters. So this is the difference between these two types. And also we have the type three. So the type three is that the gestational sac completely implanted in the myometrium of the uterine scar area and it grow protrude outward to the bladder or to the abdominal cavity. And also in this consensus, uh, they introduced uh, a subtype of the type three, that is the mass type. So in this type, it is usually after the CSP abortion. So if you, we do the ultrasound uh, um, check for the patient, we can see in the, um, in the scar area, here are the mixed uh, ultrasound echo because uh, the mass has the cystic and the solid tissue inside, which including the residue of the uh, scar pregnancy and the hematoma. So this is a Chinese uh, classification. And what is the risk of uh, CSP? So here uh, I, um, I talk about uh, three risks. The first, uh, the bleeding during the first trimester of pregnancy. And second, the increased risk of massive bleeding from the side of the implantation. And uh, the third is that the uterine rupture because of the deep implantation and the growth of the gestational sac. And uh, the last two are life threatening. And for the treatment of the CSP, mm, we should know that there is no consensus for the management of the CSB. The aim of the treatment is to first try our best to preserve the patient fertility. And the second is to prevent the life-threatening complications, including the massive hemorrhage and the uterine rupture. So, um, these um, methods are all have been used to treat the cesarean scar pregnancy. The first one is medical therapy, in which the MTX is the most used, uh, including the local usage or the uh, general usage. And also we use the, oh, sorry. And we also use the uterine artery embolization and uh, dilation and uh, carotid. Uh, laparoscopic excision, um, hysteroscopic resection, and hysterectomy. Uh, in the past uh, more than uh, 10 years ago, I think the um, high intensity focus ultrasound, which is high for, has been introduced to treat the CSP. And so let's talk about the high treatment of the cesarean scar pregnancy. Before we talk about uh, the treatment of CSP, let's review the principle of HIFU. So the HIFU is that the high intensity fo uh, focused ultrasound waves are focused at the focal spot by the transducer and to increase the focal spot, the temperature is more than 65 centigree and the coagulative necrosis is induced. And uh, also we need to know that the effect of HIFO is uh, not more than, uh, not only the heating effect, it has uh, three effects, uh, including the heating effect, cavitation effect, and the mechanical effect. So how have to treat the cesarean scar pregnancy? We recommend the combined therapy, which is uh, the HIFO plus, the ultrasound guided DNC or HIFU plus the histo hysteroscopic DNC. So what is the role of HIFU in CSP? So the first is to reduce the risk of the massive hemorrhage during the following DNC and to minimize the damage to the um, uterus because it is non-invasive and uh, to keep the integrity of the uterus and maybe can give the chance of quick recovery of the implantation area and to shorten the interval between the scar pregnancy and the following pregnancy. 
So for the half treatment or for cystic risk of pregnancy, we have the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. For the inclusion criteria, uh, the patient should be more than 18 years old. And we recommend the type one CSP, which is endogenic CSP. And the gestational age is no more than 10 weeks. And the size of the gestational sac is no more than five centimeters. And for the exclusion criteria, and uh, there is no active uh, vaginal massive bleeding and uh, patient should not um, have the risk of a uh, high risk of the uterine perforation or the rupture. And if the patient have the acute inflammation of the reproductive system, the patient is not suitable for have, we need to control her infection first. And the, previ and the previous uh, high dose abdominal radiotherapy, uh, radiotherapy is also the exclusion criteria. And for the last one is the technical exclusion. Mm, is that if we have the intestinal adhesion in a caustic pathway, that means when the ultrasound go past the bowel, there is a high risk of the bowel injury. So we should uh, not do have treatment for this kind of patient. And uh, so what is the health protocol of the C uh, CSP? So first, uh, if the patient uh, have been diagnosed of the cesarean scar pregnancy by the ultrasound or the contrast MRI, so, and also the patient is meet the inclusion criteria I mentioned before, and uh, the patient is, can be prepared to do the health treatment. So pre-treatment, we need to do some preparation including the diet preparation and uh, bowel preparation. Bowel preparation, we can do the carcasses and also the animal. Animal is not uh, um, the standard or the compulsive. And we also need to do the skin pre uh, preparation, including the degas and the degrees and also the catheterization before the half treatment. And then we do the high food treatment for this kind of patient. After the treatment, after high full, about two to three days, and we can do the um, ultrasound guided or the hysteroscopic DNC for the patient. And then we need to monitor the patient or need to follow up the patient strictly, especially for the serum beta HCG and the decrease. And we need to maybe to do the uh, serum check um, every week. And we also need to monitor the patient for the vaginal bleeding duration and follow her up for the time uh, of her menstruation return to normal. So this is the high food protocol of the cystic scar pregnancy. And uh, let's talk about the high food treatment. So what is the high food treatment for the uh, CSP? The purpose for high food is that we can ablate the nutrition vessels of the gestational sac in the scar area. And then we can lose the tightness between the gestational sac and the implantation myometrium. So our focus should be, so this uh, green or the yellow dot uh, represents the focus. So this focus should put in the implantation area and then we can get the significant hyperechoic scale changes we can, sh uh, I can show it uh, in the next slide. So um, in this slide, uh, we, uh, I want to show you how to evaluate the half effectiveness. So during the half treatment, we have the real-time ultrasound. So the real-time ultrasound um, show, can show us that uh, the significant hyperechoic scale change. We can see that this is the before half and after half the implantation area has uh, totally uh, changed, the scale totally changed. This is the intra-treatment uh, evaluation. And immediately after the high food treatment, we can do the contrast enhanced ultrasound after high food. And uh, we can see that the implant implantation area, which we ablated, we have the non-perfused area or the low-perfused area. 
So this is the two ways to evaluate the high food effectiveness. And uh, for our health doctors, we also want to uh, optimize the health treatment. So what kind of the sonication strategy is better for the treatment for, of CSB? Here is one uh, study conducted by a team. So they, they retrospectively uh, analyzed uh, their treated uh, patient and they use two kinds of different sonication strategies and they divide the patient into two groups. The first group is the C-shaped sonication and the other is the I-shaped. I will show you what is C-shaped and what is I-shaped. So we can see from this figure that the shape, we can see that the green dot is put around the sac and uh, in the implantation area, like a curve. And the eye shape is along, is in the implantation area and along the serrata like a line. So this is two different sonication strategies. And uh, uh, they first uh, compare the baseline characteristics characteristics of the patient. We can see that in these two groups, there is no difference between these two groups for the baseline characteristics. But uh, when we um, compare, compare the half treatment result, we can see that in the eye shape, the sonication time is in significantly decreased and also the total energy for the ablation is decreased. So this is the uh, half treatment parameter. And also we um, analyzed uh, the adverse events. We, we can see that in the eye shape, this group, the buttock pain or the lower abdominal pain is also significantly decreased in this group. And when we compare the ultrasound guided DNC, which is followed by the half treatment, we can see that the operation time or the blood loss or any other um, adverse events during um, this procedure, there's no difference between these two groups. So the authors, when they compared these two kinds of a strategy, they concluded that the eye shape can reduce the sonication time, the energy input, and the rate of buttock pain and neuroabdominal pain during the hive treatment with no increase of the risk um, during the DNC. So they conclude that the eye shape strategy may be more efficient and safer than the C shape. So this is the hive treatment we're trying to do some optimization for the CSP. And next, uh, I will talk about the comparison of HIFU and uh, UAE, because we know that the uterine artery uh, embolization is another minimal invasive treatment for the cesarean scar pregnancy. So what is the efficacy and the safety between these two technologies? So I find there is a meta-analysis in 2019. In this paper, the authors, researchers, they analyzed eight papers. And from their analysis, we can see that when they compare the beta HCG normalization, we can see that the uterine, the UAE, has the shorter time to get the beta HCG to um, return to the normal. And, uh, but uh, for the comparison of the blood loss during the DNC, and we found that uh, the HIFE group has um, the less blood loss during the DNC. And when compare the adverse events, also the HIFE group has the lower rate of the adverse events. And uh, for the comparison of the duration of the hospital stay, also the HIFE group has the shorter hospital stay than the UAE group. And also they analyzed the comparison of the hospital, hospitalization expense. This is the health group has the lower expense than the UAE group. And uh, at last, uh, they compared the successful rate and there is no difference. So from this meta-analysis, um, here is the summary of their results of all these uh, parts I mentioned before. 
and the researchers concluded that um, both HIFO and UAE combined with DNC were safe and effective for the cesarean scar pregnancy. Uh, and the patients in the HIFO group maybe have better outcomes than those in the UAE group. And HIFO may be a priority option for the early management of CSP. And then uh, we are also concerned about the follow-up and the fertility outcomes after the HIFO treatment of CSP. So I will show you some results. So for the follow-up, I have mentioned before, we is, uh, especially need to follow up some special index. When I uh, do the literature review from all these uh, literatures, um, I find that the average time for the serum beta HCG return back to normal is between uh, 28 to 54 days. And the average time duration of the vaginal bleeding after DNC is around five to seven days. And the average time for menstruation return to normal is about 27 to 39 days. And uh, at last, the average time for gestational sac disappear is about four to eight weeks. So this is from the literature review. And then I will show some typical cases that uh, my cases. So the first case is the endogenic type CSP. The 31 years old lady had a uh, para one with a cesarean section. Her pre half treatment beta HCG level is nearly 30,000 unit. And here is her ultrasound and the MRI images before half treatment. And here is the real-time ultrasound during our treatment. So pre half treatment, we can see the uh, gestational sac very clearly. And here is the implantation area. And intra, um, during the half treatment, we can see the scale change is induced. And after the treatment, the whole area has uh, this scale change. And uh, immediately after the treatment, when we do the contrast uh, ultrasound, we can see that here has a non-perfused area in this uh, implantation myometrium. And uh, we, uh, we do this patient uh, for 200 sonication time and within half an hour. So uh, four days later, we do the DNC for her and uh, we monitored her or followed up her for the beta HCG for se uh, several weeks. And we can see here the beta HCG level is decreased sharply. And when um, the time go to 52 days after DNC is almost uh, the normal. And uh, this lady, um, I need to mention that uh, eight months later, she had uh, another pregnancy, which is the intrauterine pregnancy. So the case two is another uh, endogenic type CSP and uh, she has para three and all these three babies are the cesarean section. And, uh, and, she, and this um, patient, she has the um, gestational sac implanted and the myometrin thickness is no more than three millimeters. And we can see pre half treatment. Here is the gestational sac. And after the treatment, we can see the scale change. And we also do the um, DNC um, four days after the half treatment. And five days after the DNC, the beta HCG decreased uh, dramatically. And then we discharged her from the hospital. Uh, when we followed her up in the outpatient, uh, we can see that 22 days after the high full and DNC treatment, the lady's uh, uterine, uh, the uterus is be, uh, becomes too normal. And uh, here is nothing in the uh, implantation area. So the third case is uh, a, a mass type CSP. And uh, this uh, young lady has one paraton and with sexual infection. And uh, she had um, menorrhea for 81 days. 
and she have had done the abortion in the clinic. And before her go to, uh, which is uh, one month before her go to our hospital. And after the abortion, she complained about the persistent mild vaginal bleeding. And uh, the beta HCG is not so high, but when we do the ultrasound and the uh, contrast MRI for her, we can see that here is a mass in the scar area. And we can see from the T2 series, the signal is hysterogeneous. So because this uh, patient want to keep her uterus and to keep the fertility and uh, we choose HIFU for her. And uh, we do the HIFU and after the HIFU, because the HCG is not so high, we decided not to do the DNC for her and only do the strictly follow up and we follow up her by the ultrasound for six months. And we can see that after six months, her uterus come back to normal. So this is uh, our uh, three typical cases. And uh, um, we also concern about the fertility outcome. And this is one of my paper published in the International Journal of Hyperthermia. And uh, I, uh, our team uh, retrospectively reviewed our treatment, uh, the HIF treatment and the DNC for the cesarean scar pregnancy. And we found that uh, in the 154 um, patients, there are 28 patients has the reproductive requirement. And uh, when we follow up them for more than, maybe more than five years, and um, um, we found that here are 23 pregnancy. And in this 23 pregnancy, here are 18 intrauterine pregnancy. And uh, here are three tubal pregnancy and uh, two recurrent uh, sister scar pregnancy. And uh, all of them have do the laparoscopic excision of the lesion in the first uh, trimester. And uh, we also follow up this uh, intrauterine pregnancy and uh, we found that here has 12 patients had the full term birth. And uh, for this uh, 12 patient, we can see that the average interval between the conception and the half treatment is 18 months. And all the patient had the full term gestational age and uh, all the baby born with the normal weight and uh, uh, all of them are healthy. And uh, here is another study conducted by our other, uh, another team with a larger group of the CSP patient. They reviewed the patient, the CSP patient treated by HIFU or the uterine, the, uh, uterine artery embolization. And they found that uh, here are 131 attempt to conceive. And uh, in this group of patient, uh, 70, 70 patients had the intrauterine pregnancy. And uh, here are 475 patients without a fertility requirement, but eight has the undesired intrauterine pregnancy. And then they analyzed the fertile group and the, the infertile group and the pregnancy group. They do the relative analyze and they found that the risk factors for the infertility is that the age is more than 35 years old and the beta HCG is no more than 5,000 units and the amenorrhea time is more than 56 days. And they also has done the relative analysis for the risk factors for recurrent CSP. They found that first is the patient treated by UAE and the numbers of abortion is more than four times and the patient being asymptomatic. So they conclude that high full seems superior to UAE in reducing the risk of recurrent CSP. So this is all my talk and before my finish and I will do some summary. So first, the advantages of combined therapy of HIFU and DNC for CSP. First is that 
the non-invasive characteristics and real-time monitoring of HIFU. And uh, um, this therapy can reduce the risk of vaginal massive bleeding and also can minimize the damage to the uterine and keep the integrity of uterus and also to keep the fertility because the cystic scar pregnancy patient usually are very young and uh, many of them has the desire to keep their fertility. And for the prospective, so we need to know that there are still some, uh, a lot of part for the development and the research for the half treatment for CSP. First, uh, we need to standardize the protocol of high food, uh, including the patient selection, a clinical dosimetry and termination criteria, et cetera. So for the patient selection, I have mentioned before that uh, we recommend to uh, do the half treatment for the endogenic um, cesarean scar pregnancy. But I find uh, the publication this year that this, uh, this group, they did high full treatment and uh, DNC, the suction carriage for the exogenic cesarean scar pregnancy. And they also report a high, a high success uh, rate uh, as high as more than 90%. So I think this kind of um, cesarean scar pregnancy maybe need more researches to do, to see whether they are suitable for the half treatment. And the second is that we need to do some uh, prospective researches of the effectiveness and the safety for the half treatment for, of CSP. And also we need to optimize the post uh, cesarean scar pregnancy and uh, you need to do some guidelines for the patient to do the following pregnancy. So this is all my topic. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Zhang Jiao Su, I'm sorry to see you in the Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Uh, no wonder the Dr. Zhang is the hyphen mentor and tutor and the set up a lot of the hyphen center uh, all over the world. Uh, I am very amazed. Uh, if I am free, I will go to Chongqing because I love Chongqing city, maybe be your fellow. Okay, is there, uh, is there any question? Actually, we have a lot of the question uh, showing the table. Okay. Uh, I think, okay, maybe Dr. Zhang, uh, yes. someone asked that, uh, if the high food work, uh, why do you need to, need to DNC again? Mm, okay. So I, I think, in my opinion, I think HIFU is like a um, pre-treatment pre for the DNC because we know mm -hmm. that for the CSP, if we do the, uh, do the single DNC, that has the very high risk of the heavy bleeding and the risk of the uterine rupture. But uh, as we said uh, in my lecture is that uh, when we do the half ablation of the implantation area, we can ablate uh, the nutrition the vessel because we know that in that area, the blood supply is very high. And if we destroy the vessel there, and then after that, uh, we take, move the gestational sac out by DNC and in that procedure, so the um, risk of the heavy bleeding should be uh, decreased, uh, dramatically decreased. Because in my experience, if we do the half treatment before and then we do the DNC, the bleeding is no more than, usually is 10 to 20 millimeter, no more than 50 millimeters. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there any chance he can, the, um, he can go up the, the, the gestational mass go up uh, is there, is there any chance? And if you have already ablated the implantation area and uh, you can 
do the maybe the uh, contrast ultrasound to emphasize or to make sure that this area is already ablated. Uh, um, it's rare, the, the, the risk is rare. Uh, actually, you have mentioned now after high food for CSP, the recurrent rate is the 23 over 131. Actually, it is almost 18%. So the recurrent rate is a little high. Uh, do you any about this data? Here. Um, so for this data, I haven't seen before, but I only um, through my literature review. Um, so yes, uh, after, um, so for the patient to have the cesarean scar pregnancy before, no matter what kind of method she have done, if she want to keep her uterus, so she um, have the chance, no matter what kind of the method have done, she has a chance to have a recurrent uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. But uh, when we compared the high food uh, with the uterine artery uh, embolization, the rate uh, is uh, lower than the uterine artery embolization. And uh, also, I think the um, doctors have mentioned before that uh, if the patient has the desire to have another baby, so the UAE is, is not uh, recommended for her, but uh, HIFU can be another choice for her. Thank you. Is there any question? No. Okay. May I? Uh, may I have? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your beautiful presentation. And it was really eye opening. And uh, I have one question and one comment. Uh, question is uh, pro as for protocol, high treatment uh, may decrease the region and uh, maybe itself decrease HCG. And you, your protocol, Two days or three days after HIFU, you do surgery, D and C. But I, I wonder, uh, maybe one week later, it may be more easier. How, uh, how do you think of it? How, why do you decide two days after, three days after HIFU? Okay, thank you, Professor Tsutsumi. So uh, this protocol is uh, all by our team, especially under the leading of Professor Zhang Lian. So um, because after the half treatment, uh, we know that uh, we have the uh, heat, uh, heat effect of the implantation area. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has some um, the edema, edema in that area. So the edema will be disappear within uh, 72 hours. So we recommend that in this 72 hours, we do not do any uh, transvaginal um, procedures for the patient to wait this edema to be disappeared or to be uh, eased. Okay, uh, uh, one comment. And if you have five, you don't have to do uh, uterine artery embolism UAE and because UAE may damage uterine function and also ovarian function. So HIFU is much, much better than UAE, it's my opinion. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Tsutsumi. Yes, it's also what I'm thinking about is the HIFU, especially for the keep the function of uterine or the ovary function is better than UAE. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tsutsumi, and uh, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Uh, because the time is limited, I, am, I know there's a lot of questions and the need Dr. Zhang come back. Maybe you can go to Chongqing and visit to the Dr. Zhang and face to face to ask the least question. The wonderful session and no wonder Dr. Zhang is a uh, high food mentor. So, I need to close this session and uh, give to my talk to the uh, Dr. Tsutsumi. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Thank you. So uh, finally, uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chan, and uh, three speakers of uh, Dr. Aizra, Lee, and Tan. And uh, maybe all the participants enjoyed it very much. And uh, will you please remember uh, next uh, 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 webinar will be held July 21st, third one. And I also uh, remind you that uh, coming September, uh, we will have 22nd uh, annual meeting of Apogee in Taipei, Taiwan. And I hope to see you face to face if possible. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, it may be time to take maybe photo. Okay. Uh, thank you for your cooperation. It's uh, time to say uh, goodbye and uh, thank them. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Okay. Several times. Yeah, see you in Taipei. Yeah. Bye, bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you very much.